This is the Wrench in the Machine, an association of Ishtar Story by Bonsert Bokel and edited by Dean Wilkins, with music by Marco Ilianello of Musical Wizardry. Chapter 1 Good morning, Dover. I'm Frank Dimbleby of the Dover Public Broadcast. This news bulletin is provided by the Kent News Network of the 7th of May, 1875. It's one minute past eight. Some of today's highlights. The discussion on the expansion of Kent's rescue services. The controversy around the proposed Home Army Bill that is about to enter Parliament. Finally, a debate on the question, is our entertainment being weaponized? This discussion was sparked after a reviewer of the London Journal accused a London playwright latest stage play of being signalite propaganda. But first, more protests at the Autocrab main office after the company announced the expansion of its space program. The protesters claim the weaponization of the rockets is inevitable. They display drawings of Napoleon I throwing R2 rockets at England with the phrase Never forget. More demonstrations have been announced, including one near Pendleton War Park Memorial in Dover. Excuse me, our producer just came in with a special bulletin. This is just in. The Dover Borough Police announced the Dover Priory Railroad Station has been locked down. This is due to a crime committed on the premises last night. They advise the public to use other means of transportation for the remainder of the day. They apologize for the inconvenience. On with the program. The rhythm of galloping hooves slowed down as the coach pulled in in front of the Dover Priory Railroad Station. As soon as the carriage came to a standstill, the door swung open, and Inspector David Alborough stuck his head out of the tobacco-smelling coupé and coughed. As he got out, he breathed the spring air in through his nose and sighed. It was a breezy morning after a night of light rain, and the aromatic smell of wet fauna drifted in the air. But the moment Alborough began to move, he felt clammy, and the sunlight revealed the unkempt state of his brown tweed waistcoat. Inspector Bixby followed him outside, ready to produce another cigarette, despite finishing the last one just moments ago. Alborough did not mind his younger colleague's smoking habit that much. It was the stale smell of smoke that bothered him. As Alborough brushed the fluff of his vest, a young, well, to the inspector's standards anyway, dressed in a blue, leaning police coat approached him in a huff. Alborough addressed him first. As was his custom. Morning, Dobby. What do you have for us today? The young officer saluted and gave his report. Morning, sass. It's a weird one. Two seps dead, both night watchmen. They're cut up bad by the maniac. But that's not the weird thing, he added ominously. A double homicide is not good enough, asked Bixby. You better see it for yourself, sirs. Derby said, nodding his head slightly, and walked away like a young boy who was about to show something off. The inspectors found his behavior odd, but shrugged their shoulders and went along with the constable. The young officer wasn't kidding about the railway men. Their lifeless bodies were found beside a train that was scheduled to be unloaded that very morning. Both victims were elderly guards, merely present to be a deterrent against criminals at night. Now they lay there, in the same position as the moment they were slain. Quite efficiently so, or so Alborough fought. Derby explained the situation. Barry Wilts and Jonathan Slober, aged 75 and 86, worked for the LCDR for several years now, started working the night shift a few years back. Meanwhile, Alborough looked at all the signs. The men were killed where they stood. Wilts had been stepped through the throat with such force his back was pressed against the sides of the railway carriage and left a trail of blood on the rough boards as he collapsed. Mr. Slober had dropped to the ground in fright. Alborough imagined a poor man looking up at his murderer as he tried to shield himself with his arm, which consequently got severed at the elbow. The limb got slashed with such force it lay six feet away from the body on the terminal floor. 
Then Slova was stabbed several times in the throat and chest, as if he was a pin cushion. Alboro bent his knee, and inspected the severed arm on the terminal floor, still clutching a handle of an electric lantern. The cut seemed clean, surgical even. No axe could have done so without rending the flesh. There was just too much force to be applied for a knife. A saber, perhaps? The inspector still found this unlikely. Squatted, Bixby carefully observed his quarry, Mr. Wills. One straight horizontal step through the artery and went straight out the back of the neck, right into the panel behind him, Bixby remarked as he rose to his feet. Then he pointed out a deep cut mark in the sideboard near the top of the blood trail. The murderer severed the spine, looks like. Nerd rules out an axe, groaned Allborough, and raised himself. Bixby, look at the distance between these bodies. His colleague took position between the corpses and spread his arms wide. Both in arm's reach. Seems a bit neat for an ordinary criminal, he concluded. I suppose the victims found a trespasser, approached them, and once in reach they were attacked. Indeed, said Alborough, looking at the severed arm. They were too close together to be stabbed by a saber like that, and the murderer couldn't have looked that threatening if they approached him voluntarily. He carried a concealed weapon then, Bixby thought out loud. How about a butcher's knife? Alboro considered it, but shook his head. The puncture wounds look too narrow. Maybe the cornerer can come up with something. Alboro turned to the young officer. Constable Derby, anything taken? Like wallets or badges? No, sir, nothing's missing, the lad answered. Not even from the cargo inside the wagon, we think. Alboro looked at the open carriage door beside the body leaning against the carriage. Is that what you wanted to show us? The constable nodded, gesturing them to follow him. What they discovered inside the cargo hold was indeed something to behold. Cold fumes arose from within the crate as the inspector stared at the body curled up inside. Above it, scratched crudely inside the interior of the lid, was a number 54. Bixby stroked his fingers through his hair. This is indeed something you don't see every day. Indeed, murmured Alborough, distracted by the number scratched inside a broken lid. The fact it was just a number was ominous enough, but for some reason it had a stripe struck through it, like a notch on a gun handle. The many scratches that comprised the numbers have been carved vindictively into the resin, which was in stark contrast to the neat executions outside. What do you think it means? Arboro asked, scratching the burn scar on his right jaw. Calling card, guessed Bixby. Like a villain from one of those wave serials, remarked Arboro. I swear, those things are a bad influence, he complained, and looked inside the crate. What about this fine gentleman? The frosting eyes was dripping down the body's eyebrow as they observed a middle-aged man lying in the shallow bath of icy water. Alboro concluded that the man was probably a working-class stiff, no pun intended. The inspector based his assumption on the ward and old-fashioned clothes the victim was wearing, not that dissimilar of his own. A broad, purplish line around his throat betrayed he was hanged before being stuffed in there. The inspector laid his hand on the smooth, yellowish sides of the crate's interior and scanned the surface of his fingers. The lid, which was laid discarded on the ground, had a similar inlay. It felt similar to ember resin, but more flexible and without the discoloration. What are the sides made of? A uh, plastic, I suspect, responded Bixby. Utter crap claims plastic will replace ember resin and most metal alloys in the next twenty years. Bixby was always on top of new developments. Maybe it was just his generation, hooked on wavecasters and eager to hear what could await them in the future. Alboro knocked on the plastic with the knuckles of his index fingers. It produced a hollow sound. It's probably a vacuum in there, Bixby continued. It's how the contents remained frozen until the murderer broke the lid. Meanwhile, Aubro was looking at two crates in similar size that had been broken open. These contained boxes and random trinkets, but no obvious damage from implements like a crowbar was to be seen. Alboro turned to Bixby. How long you think the body had been in there? Based on the French labels in the box, I say less than two weeks. I can hardly tell if rigor mortis had time to set in due to the ice. Orbro moved the victim's trouser leg up and lay bare a purplish-blue skin. Does this look broken to you? Trauma to the lower leg. Mostly heavily bruising and abrasions due to being tied up. 
There are similar injuries on the wrist. The ankle seemed to have been contracted oddly. Might be due to trauma. So, he was either in a fight or tortured. Then he was hung by the neck. Alboro put his hand in his side. Why bother breaking into a carriage if they're murdering two men just to open this crate? Maybe they wanted us to find the body, Bixby suggested. You know, get us on the trail of those who put him in there. The other inspector finished his spots. And then we take care of their competition. Other than that, Bixby pondered out loud, if the body itself was so valuable, why leave it? Maybe he was expecting something else, suggested Alborough. The constable stepped forward with hesitation in the step. According to the station master, this crate was supposed to be picked up from the depot this morning, he said softly. By whom? Howard and Chambers Logistics, sir, announced Constable Derby. To the young man's delight, the old inspector nodded approvingly. Good work, constable. I never heard of them, mumbled Bixby. Neither have I. That will be your first step, then. Constable, take care of the Frenchman. Bixby stepped closer. If he's indeed a foreign, this needs to be reported to Scotland Yard. Indeed, and I don't want to be bothered with the paperwork. That is why we'll find out where this Howard and Chambers lot hangs out. Derby wanted to protest. But sirs, if you don't... Look at this as valuable work experience, Constable. All borough it. Also, you will get to show your face at the Chief Inspector's office when he needs you to sign the final forms. I suppose. Good man. Give me the address and we're good to go. Come, Bixby. On the way to the old industrial district, the inspector's carriage drove past the working class apartments of Dover. Alborough was in luck. This was a no smoking cabin. The interior didn't even have that stale tobacco smell like most carriages. Bixby, however, was already fidgeting with his feet. Are you sure you wouldn't rather be signing forms? asked Bixby. This might be a foreign affairs thing. Alboro pouted his lips. Probably. But if we have smugglers in our town, they are our responsibility. True enough. Funny, last night there was an episode of The Shade on the caster called Cold Case. I'm sure there was, responded Alboro half-heartedly. Even when Bixby started to summarize the plot, the old inspector was distracted by a blimp passing over the city, parading Uta Crab stack line, Bringing tomorrow's future today. Do you even have a wastecaster, David? asked Bixby. No, Alboro responded absentmindedly. I was born before that time, and I always managed to keep myself occupied with dolls, sir. Hell no, I was an animal man, Alboro announced proudly. I preferred the wilds and the sensation of the wind on my face as I rode around on my hobby horse with a pen on my head and like the knights of old. All of a sudden, he felt an unexpected sense of melancholy. But one day, I realized I had no idea where I left that hobby horse. My father made it for me, and I just forgot about it. When I recalled the horse, I just... The inspector changed the subject. Do parents still make toys for their children, Tom? My grandfather did, Bixby answered, after his retirement. I mean, these days we can't make stuff as cheaply as the companies can. Things are changing. Alboro looked at the blimp again. You don't say. That cool box, Bixby began pedantically. Imagine that cool box. If we can save bodies that way, we can preserve food. Did you just use the word food and body in one sentence, Bixby? B well, he muttered, caught of God. You know what I mean. The coach slowed down as the driver announced. This is as close as I can get, gentlemen. This place is a mess. Abandoned crates and junk go everywhere from here on out. How come? Bixby asked as they got out. Lots of abandoned warehouses and closed down companies. They just left their wares on the street. Another score for progress, I assume, mumbled Alboro. You know anything about Howland and Chambers by any chance? The driver seemed surprised by the question. Just by the name, sir. But I've never seen them around, if you catch my drift. Alboro nodded. The statement confirmed his suspicion that HNC was probably just a front, because Dover was the gate to England. There was no shortage of such companies. The government, on the grounds of liberal principle, didn't allow the police to perform invasive investigation into private property. Not until somebody complained anyway, so these fronts could flourish. 
As the inspectors entered the district, they realized the driver wasn't kidding either. The alleys, originally intended for freight transport, were cluttered with abandoned wares and rusting devices. Some warehouses were converted to workshops occupied by craftsmen who obviously didn't require all that space. But the building owners would take on any tenants at this point. Finally, they found it, an unremarkable warehouse with a large sign in front displaying Howard and Chambers Logistics. It had an entrance gate for a single wagon and a normal door beside it. The paint had started to flake off the wetted brickwork, but other than that, the building didn't seem in too bad a condition. Alboro knocked politely on the plain door and waited. There was no response. Alboro knocked again. This is working hours, Bixby complained. They should be in. This time, Alboro slammed his twist on the door. Anyone there? This is the police. We have questions for you. Allow me, Bixby said when no reply came. With a loud thump, the inspector knocked down the door and broke it off his hinges. Oh, bloody hell, he cried, kneeling forward. Be careful, inspector. Alboro grinned at his colleague's expense. I'm not the only one growing older. Alboro's smile disappeared when he heard a child giggle in the distance. Just help me up, will you? I hurt my knee. Bixby cringed. Oh, right. Alboro responded, distracted, and aided his colleague. You heard that? Heard what? He listened for a moment. Never mind, said Alboro, while looking around the hangar. Everything seemed to be in order. Stables, a shaft, a pulley system for loading and unloading, a staircase to the attic. It didn't appear in disuse. But there was no obvious cargo either. Looks empty to me, Bixby stated while brushing himself off. I can see that. It's probably a front. Just to move somebody seems a tad extreme. A loud thump shook the man up who looked up at the ceiling. It sounded like a box hitting the floorboards. Chins raised, the inspector stared upward. Mixby pulled out his surface pistol with his eyes focused on the attic. Who's there? Put that away, man, warned Alboro. Intensely, he observed the planks overhead. Then, from the corner of his eye, he saw a shadow move between the cracks. He glanced at Bixby, who nodded to confirm that he saw it too, and then they moved slowly to the staircase. Come on, we know you're there, said Alboro sternly. Show yourself, we are with the police. Without sudden movements, the inspectors walked up the steps. Carefully, they rose their heads above the floorboards and scanned the attic for any movement behind the sacks, crates and barrels. We just want you to answer a few questions reiterated Alboro, but there was no response. The layout of the floor was simple. At the front end, there was an enclosed office area. At the other, nothing but a broken ceiling window just above some stacked-up barrels. Too small for adults, but just big enough for a child. Alboro gestured to his colleague to head for the office, and he moved in the opposite direction. This is your last chance. If you keep resisting, we'll have no choice but to... He raised his voice dramatically. Bring you in. Another loud bang made the inspector jump off his feet as the weight of the fallen object reverberated through the floorboards. Startled, Alboro turned around to see Bixby staring at a fallen crate in front of him. Bixby? He looked at him in denial. I swear, I did... Sir, behind you! The inspector turned around to spot the shape of a child climbing the pile of barrels toward the broken window. Stop! he cried and gave chase. But the youngster already made its way to the roof. Stop you! Alboro yelled again as he climbed the bottom barrel. I just want to... Ah! He lowered his leg as his thigh cramped up. There it was again. That childish laughter. He looked at the window where a small girl giggled at his expense, her hair reflecting bright orange sunlight. You little... He stopped as he noticed a weird reflection in the light of her left eye, like that of a cat. Then she dashed away. Are you all right? asked Bixby as he came over. I'm fine, he shouted, holding a spy. Go after... I can't fit through that hole, man! 
The dismayed officers fell silent as they looked around idly. What the hell happened? complained Alboro. I swear, that crate moved by itself, Bixby responded defensively. Alboro looked away in disbelief. I wasn't even close, he reiterated and relaxed with a sigh. How's your leg? I'm fine, the old inspector grumbled as he staggered toward the office. The door of the room was unlocked, and the officers moved in to inspect the place. It was obvious someone had been staying here. There was a makeshift bed, drawings on the desk of young people with freakishly large eyes, candy wrappers smelling of raspberry toffee lay scattered on the ground. Beside the pillow on the bed, there was an old rag doll. It looked a bit impish, with a large, oblong head, egg-shaped eyes, and a white-stitched smile. Its fantastical robe, shell-shaped hat, and red mop of hair made him suspect it was supposed to be a witch. Whatever it was supposed to be, he had never seen any toy like it. Now what? Bixby asked. Alvaro spotted a note on the desk and picked it up. The moment he glanced at its contents, he squinted his eyes in dismay. The writing seemed to be an odd mixture of Arabic and Gothic letter styles. Any attempts to mumble out the phrases ended up in nothing but nonsensical gibberish. But there was a sentence he did make out, written in forced English handwriting. Gossel Hill Road. 44, Alboro whispered to himself. He knew it wasn't that far from Priory Station. Found anything, David? yelled Bixby from the other room. Nothing, he answered. We'll tell them we found an empty warehouse. Bixby walked in, dusting off his bowler hat. And the child? You wanna go look for an urchin in Dover, be my guest, he answered in jest. I have enough to do. The 8th of May, 1875, 10 a.m., Castle Hill Road, Dover. The high-pitched ringing of the doorbell broke the silence as the door closed behind the inspector. Aghast, he looked at his surroundings as the smell of sweet perfume and dust overwhelmed him. Wherever Alboro looked, Toy monkeys looked menacingly at him. Bears with unkept fur and dress uniforms yawned, and of course, porcelain ladies in pretty dresses looked disinterested from atop their shelves. The store was far too small for the number of toys it contained. But maybe a child could feel at home, here in Hendrix Dollhaven. Curiously, the inspector made his way past the tables, careful not to knock over any toys. In the far corner at the back, a tranquil woman in a lavender dress sat behind a sewing machine, undeterred by the ringing of the doorbell. Dark, flowing hair covered her cheeks as he mended a plush line with a needle and thread. Arboro took off his hat. <clears throat> um, excuse me, startled, she looked up from her craft. I'm sorry. She got up, brushing off the fluff of her skirt. Can I help you? Gently moving aside a baby carriage, Alboro asked, Is this number 44? She nodded, while swiping an untidy braid from her cheek. Yes, that's right. Oh, good. I'm Inspector Alboro, and I'm looking for a child. She seemed a bit puzzled by the question. Well, children, come here, she responded with uncertainty in her voice. Alboro noticed a bear in a Napoleonic uniform behind her, staring bloodthirsty into the distance with its jaws wide open. You don't say... Do you have a child living with you? She shook her head politely. No, I'm not even married. I see. He was looking around until a hobby horse caught his attention. Excuse me, where did you get that toy from? I used to have a horse identical to that one. Yes, these used to be made by a local carpenter a long time ago. Sometimes I find one. They're quite rare these days. People prefer to buy new toys. A shiver went down his spine. Made by a carpenter, you say. Alboro had always believed his father had made him that hobby horse. Just for him. She nodded awkwardly. Anyway, children bring them to me. They find them in the trash or places like that. I give them candy for their effort. He noticed the way she kept her hands folded in front of her lap and the sweat gloves she wore that covered the hands down to the tip of her fingers. I see. Did an urchin with ginger hair come by by any chance? He noticed her eyebrows move. No, she said abruptly. Can't say that I have seen him. I don't really notice what happens in front of the store, she answered, smiling gently. He smiled along with her. I noticed. So, is there much demand for refurbished dolls? 
I mostly make my money with repairs, to be honest. He glanced at the bared Napoleonic uniform again, knowing he had seen it somewhere before. But he let the thought slide and prepared to leave. But then he turned around. One more thing. Did you ever do business with a company named Howard and Chambers, Miss Hendricks? Her face seemed frozen for a moment. Uh, no, she responded aloof. My brother's name was Hendrik. Hendrik Boerhaven? The inspector squinted his eyes. I'm sorry, Miss... Henrietta Boerhaven. He raised an eyebrow. Is your family Dutch, Miss Boerhaven? Our parents were refugees from the French Empire. Orange royalists, you see. And this place is your brother's. She answered, shaking her head. It used to be. There was a certain sadness about her movements. Alboro nodded sympathetically. Well, I will not bother you any longer, miss, he said, and left for real this time. The bell rang again when he closed the door behind him. As he walked down the street, he wondered if he dodged the question about Howard and Chambers intentionally. Regardless, he was convinced he knew about the girl. Another fact, but was it worth pursuing? Back at the station of Dover's Borough Police, the old inspector sat at his desk, reflecting on the day. The ground floor of the old building, on the corner of Park and Ladywell, was bustling with activity. The desks were surrounded by the balustrades of the first and second floor, giving Alborough the sense that he was sitting at the centre of a cathedral. The only way up was a black oak double staircase that came together on the first floor, with a half landing in between. The stairs to the second floor were more straightforward, as if the Tudor designers had given up at that point. The whole interior of the place felt like style over substance, but it was a blessing it survived the bombardments by Napoleon, as it was an ever rarer link to the past. The building used to be a convent. After the Reformation, it was rebuilt to serve as a weighing house, then a manor that fell into disuse. That is, when it was decided it would serve as the headquarters of the new borough police. Al Burrow's father had been one of the first men to join the constabulary of Dover after its founding about 30 years ago. The man walked the beat till the end of his days, seven hours a day, seven days a week. Of course, Al Burrow did not depreciate his father's commitment then, as he did now. Al Burrow turned to the picture of his father hanging on the wall, next to two other officers who had died in a line of duty in the department's three-decade-long history. The portraits of the other two peelers still wore the uniforms that resembled the civilian fashion of the day, including top hats. How things had changed. One spacious office was filled with three rows of desks now. Plastered walls were covered in paintings and photos related to the department's history, including newspaper articles on past successes. One of them even included Alborough's name, but he preferred not to think about it. The first page article was regarding a house fire that happened ten years ago. It used to hang in a more prominent place too, near his desk. But after a year or so, his colleagues got the hand and silently relocated it. He wouldn't have minded if they removed the frame altogether. The peelers were meant to chase drunkards, thieves and other petty criminals for 14 shillings a week. Then constables became firefighters as well. It wasn't a terrible idea, but as the events ten years prior had proven, Dover would be better off with a professional fire brigade, the first of its kind in the country, and was soon emulated in nearby cities like London. Alborough was asked to be one of its founding members, but he hadn't even bothered to reply. Relieved of their firefighting responsibilities, the police was now allowed to raid bordellos and other places of ill repute. Anything to prevent crimes from occurring in the first place. Some new measures allowed them to fulfill their tasks more dutifully. Others, well, in Alboro's experience, inventing new crimes just created more criminals. Regardless, the borough police had proved its worth in an ever-changing world. And it was Alboro himself who managed to convince his superiors that he and his peers should wear civilian clothes during investigations, as it made citizens more cooperative. This was during a time when a bobby without a uniform was a big taboo. Yes, he was a hot-blooded man back then. Alboro lay a hand on his belly. He had become a bit of a Mr. Plump since then. With a sigh, he crossed his arms and leaned back in his chair. 
As he stared at the dark wooden beams that supported the high ceiling, his mind dwelt on the day's events. There was no motive, no witnesses, just an empty warehouse and a mysterious number left on the lid. Fifty-four, he mumbled. I wouldn't put too much pot in that number, said Bixby as he walked past. With a thud, Bixby placed a lunch bag on his desk and dropped himself into a chair. So, where have you been today? Oh, please, Tom. We're not married, just at Alboro. You didn't tell anyone about the child, did you? Not yet. Why? he asked, before taking a bite of his sandwich. Just a hunch, Alboro mumbled. Tom, have you seen the constable who took care of the crime scene? Yeah, Derby took care of the paperwork and left. No, oh, that was quick, the inspector responded, impressed. Efficient lad, isn't he? I'm sure he reminds you of yourself, senior inspector, jested Bixby. I wouldn't give him that much credit, Alboro sneered, deadpanned. Did you find out who owns that Howard and Chambers warehouse? Bixby sighed exhaustedly. I requested the information from the Chamber of Commerce, but they said they're going to be a while. Alboro looked at his colleague. They're having problems with their archival engines again, I'm sure. The only thing those machines are good for is producing excuses. His junior offered him a sandwich. Well, be prepared, Bixby began. The revenue service is going to start the mechanization process next year. Alboro took a bite of a sandwich and let the taste of roast chicken with walnut fill his mouth. Well, in that case, he said, mouthing his jaws, we might never have to pay taxes ever again. I wish, Bixby replied cynically. Everything is going downhill in this town except my property value. But you know who was on time? He asked pedantically. The folks who pay our salaries? The Metropolitan Police who picked up the Frenchman. Arboro blinked sheepishly. That was quick, he responded, surprised. That reminds me. Found anything about that box the victim was in? Bixby shoved his fingers together. That's a dandanda, I'm afraid. Crates with PVC inlay are already quite common in the kingdoms of the Netherlands. They use them in the fishing industry. About half a year ago, they started using them to transport sea fish by train into the German kingdoms and beyond. Anyone can get one on the continent. Alboro slanted his shoulders and shook his head. Everything is changing so fast it's getting ridiculous. Somebody told me the other day, Bixby began philosophically, if you want to change your line of work, learn to solder. Ever tried getting an electrician to fix your wiring? Alboro ignored it. The Dover he knew was gone. The world beyond seemed to be more alien as well. Then a clear voice pierced the humdrum of the office from the other side of the room. David! Alboro looked over his shoulder to the chief inspector, who stood on the half landing of the stairs, just to the side of his office. Can you come over here for a moment? The sweet scent of pipe tobacco triggered a mild dizziness as Alboro sat unwillingly in front of the chief inspector's desk. Opposite him, Mayfair blew out another smoke plume before continuing one of his typical rants. David, have you ever considered offering yourself up for promotion? Sure, you might sit behind the desk, but why not? You're not getting any younger. The inspector had sat there, pretending to listen until he finally responded, Oh, stop it. You sound like my housekeeper. Don't you mean your wife? Arthur responded in jest. Not funny. She's a widow for Pete's sake. Didn't her husband die years ago? How does that matter? Mayfair blew out a final plume of smoke and started to clean out the ball of his pipe above a trash bin. You know what your problem is? You're a brave man, but you're scared of long-term commitment. Hmm, David groaned. Life is passing you by, you know, Arthur said with some dramatic flair. Hmm. I mean, you're committing yourself to this, so you sure you can commit yourself to something different? Mm. Alboro heard similar speeches so many times before, he learned to shut it out. He was where he wanted to be, doing what he enjoyed and was good at. Surely, it was good enough. But deep down, he knew the chief was right. Still, it didn't feel right. I don't know, Arthur. I couldn't do what you do, Alboro responded, self-deprecating. I mean, how we need to deal with that door that we broke down this morning. Mayfair smiled dismissively. If only we could find the owner. Dad raised an eyebrow. Didn't get the impression that the warehouse was in disuse. 
The chief shrugged his shoulders. So some smugglers are using it. I doubt they'll be back. Regardless, some suits of Scotland Yard can go through the process to find out who that Frenchman could be. Tilting his head, Albert asked, What about the dead railway men? The chief put down his pipe. All we know that the murderer stabbed them with two identical daggers. Two what? Alboro responded with a mixture of surprise and dismay. This guy now sounds like a villain from some audio drama that everyone is listening to. The chief nodded in agreement. By the way, did you know that the last show was called The Cold Case? Yeah, yeah, Alboro groaned. That episode of The Shade, Tom already told me all about it. Villains are using exotic weapons and leaving calling cards. If this keeps up, criminals like these become the rule rather than the exception. Are you referring to that mysterious number 45 the perp left behind? The chief asked. The inspector nodded when their conversation was interrupted by a knock on the office door. Come in, the chief said. A man in a long coat and neatly ironed pantaloons, holding a bowler hat to his chest, appeared in the entrance. I'm so sorry about disturbing you, the man began apologetically with a neat academic accent. I'm Inspector Sterling from the Home Office. Apologies for being late. The wheel of a cart broke the moment we wanted to leave. But now we are here to collect a body. Really? responded the chief surprised. Another one? The other man shook his head in confusion. Uh, excuse me? Yes. Some of your colleagues were here this morning to collect a Frenchman we found. He slowed down as the eyes of Mr. Sterling grew wider and asked, concerned, Say, don't tell me you're here for the Frenchman. A few moments later, the cry of a man in anguish reverberated through the ancient halls. They what? The chief leaned over his desk when he heard the news that a corpse had been stolen from the morgue. Yes, Bixby admitted. Both inspectors stood in front of the chief's desk, while Mayfair sunk away in his chair, growing paler every passing second. It appears the ones who collected the body this morning were imposters masquerading as Metropolitan Police, Bixby continued. They even had an enclosed cart in police trappings. We sent word to the patrols. Mayfair groaned as he buried his face in his hands. This is disgraceful. How am I going to explain this to the commissioner? The panic in his voice was palpable. Alboro cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Who assisted these impostors? Constable Derby, sir, responded Bixby reluctantly. A chill ran down his spine. Derby, repeated Alboro. I only told him to do the paperwork. Now, he regretted his laziness, although he could forgive himself for the sheer ridiculousness of the situation. Where is he? We assume on patrol. Bixby said, but now we're not quite sure. Anyway, witnesses claim they saw an enclosed police carriage heading west. They could be heading for London town. The chief inspector straightened himself. I need you to find out what happened, he insisted. If the Metropolitan Police finds the thieves first, we'll never hear the end of it. Oboro tried to sound positive. Don't worry, Arthur. I have a hunch. But it's a long shot. The chief slammed his fist on the desk. I don't care. Just find them. The two inspectors looked at each other. Will do, sir. Come, Bixby. There is someone I want to keep an eye on. Where to? I'll explain later, Alboro answered while putting on his bowler head. We are running out of time. Nearly an hour had passed, and the flow of people in the street grew thinner while the sun descended behind the townhouses. The officers waited on the corner of Castle Hill Road. They got there fast, thanks to a new addition to the police force. Bicycles. It just bought an Alboro the Uter Crap logo was printed into the metal of the frame, barely visible under the dark blue paint, but there it was, nonetheless. Meanwhile, Bixby was sitting down on a bench, pretending to read the day's newspaper while keeping an eye on Hendrick's Dollhaven. The top article was, of course, the Priory Station Stabbing. Bixby read the finely printed words critically. Listen to this, he began. Dover's first serial killer. Ah, they seem to have forgotten about all those arsons from a while back. A good headline to make people forget about a lot of things, grumbled Alboro cynically. Crooked politician being investigated. Just announce a long-awaited book. Economic recession, talk about how one of the Queen's dogs died. Folks care more about their tea than the empire collapsing. Bixby raised his eyebrows after listening to his rant. Guess it is a nice diversion from the recession. 
Oh, look, there's no mention of the Frenchman in this piece. Alvaro sighed as he stood with his back against the wall. Probably for the best, considering how the relations are with the continent at the moment. We always need to think about the big picture, I suppose. It's enough to drive a man mad, Alvaro complained. So most choose to ignore it. So, who is this woman then? Bixby asked, peering past the newspaper at the store. That is what I want to find out, responded Alboro. It's unlikely she can support herself by repainting toys in this economy, that's for sure. And then we found her address in a smuggler's den. Alleged den. Wait. Bixby folded up the newspaper. Miss Boerhaave had just left the store and walked up to a passenger coach. The moment she got on the carriage, the officers put on their cycling goggles and stepped on their bicycles. And so the chase began. Tailing the carriage from a safe distance, the inspectors followed the cab to the west of the city and beyond its boundaries. Puffing and groaning, Alboro felt his thighs acting up as he developed saddle pains. How oh, is your knee? Makes me, he asked with exaggerated bluster, despite his heavy breathing. Speak for yourself. Old man, Bixby retorted. The scent of the sea grew stronger as the officers paddled on, and so did the wind. They had to rise from their seat and put their full weight on the pedals to keep up. Finally, the coach reached its destination, the perimeter of the abandoned harbour. The officers stopped and observed Miss Boerhaave when she got off in front of the gate to the old piers. The brick boundary around the area was covered in soot and bird droppings, and one half of the gate was forced open by vandals. The few people that still worked here cared little for the public property these days, and the sound of industry had been replaced by the cries of seagulls. It was not so long ago this place was rife with activity, but the old ducks of Dover could not handle the increasing ship sizes and payloads. Meanwhile, London's harbours expanded, and the companies had taken their business westward. All that remained was a collection of dilapidated buildings at the dead end of the rail tracks, being eaten away by the salty sea wind. Quietly, the officers followed Boerhaave from a distance as he paced up to the yard. Here, the workers used to maintain the cranes and other machines that moved up and down the rails by the pier. Careful not to take any risk, the inspectors took their time approaching the complex. The large buildings consisted of riveted cast iron beams that supported the sloping roof. Beside the wall, in the shadows of the depot, the peelers spotted activity. From behind a fence, the officers observed how two men were hastily painting the exterior of an enclosed coach black over police blue, while the horses were patiently waiting in place. They quickly concluded this had been the vehicle that carried away the Frenchman's body. Alboro inspected the coach in more detail. It seemed like a typical car used for moving cargo, but it seemed remarkably close to the ground. Reaching for his surface revolver, Bixby remarked, I think we found them. There could be more, warned Alboro. Let's avoid them for now. Moving from rust brown container to container, they entered the roofed area. Overhead, between the rafters remained some of the chains, cranes and platforms that were used in machine maintenance. On the track stood a small steam locomotive, still attached to some carts it used to haul around the area, it made Alboro wonder if Dover was doing so poorly it couldn't even find work for such an engine. Beneath the depot's roof there was another structure like storage rooms and small terminals. One of these was a single-story building that might have belonged to the management staff. Here, behind a window on the ground floor, burnt a faint light that attracted their attention. Are we just going to barge in? Bixby whispered as they moved closer to the structure. No, I want to see for myself what they're up to, Alboro said and glanced around the corner of the entrance. A grainy tune played in the background as they peered into what appeared to be a locker room. At the back, there were two doorways. One led to a cafeteria of sorts with two large tables and a bench covered in grime. The other appeared to be a small office space with its furniture trashed. Quietly, they went inside. Despite the static-laden music, reverberating voices were audible from a room beyond the cafeteria. Some men and a woman. Oh, look! Bixby pointed at the wireless device on the cafeteria table. A genuine utter crap bar, too, he remarked pedantically. That thing could be as old as I am. 
Thank you for that, Alboro responded apathetically as he observed the interior. From this angle, he could see light coming from another room, but not the doorway itself, just the shadows that moved across the floor. As Alboro looked over his shoulder, some light spots were being projected on the surface of a locker door. He checked the small office space. It turned out there were several holes in the wall there, left by the looters, presumably. Alboro went inside and pressed his face against the moldy boards. His open eye struggled to adjust to the bright light as he peeked inside the chamber at the other side of the barrier. The space was arranged like a makeshift operating room. Beside the table was a standing lamp. Its light focused on the shaven head of the missing Frenchman that was mostly covered up by a blanket. Alboro reached for his notebook and penned down his observations. He heard Borhave speak from beyond the line of sight of his pinhole. You're taking too great a risk, she said. The woman did not sound as gentle as back at the store, but it was most definitely her. A man responded with a loud laborous voice that was accustomed to talking inside a factory. The longer you're going to complain, the longer it's gonna take. Just take it out. An inspector came by today, she said. He seemed shocked. And? Miss Boerhaave stepped into view with several implements in her gloved hands. And nothing. She answered while laying her tools on the table and inspected a small rotary saw. What? Just a casual visit? They were looking for a pickpocket. Alboro frowned at that statement as he watched her pluck the cord into another device. The circular saw made a nasty zooming sound as the blade started to spin and the inspector cringed as the electric saw did its work on the scalp of the body. Alboro noticed Bixby's concerned look. He was anxious to do something, anything, but Alboro kept observing. This was more than just about a body in a box. He had encountered red herrings in his career before, but nothing this baffling. Finally, the electric device was turned off. The inspectors could not get a detailed view of the proceedings, but they could hear the squishing sound of her poking and prodding with the tweezers. I found it, she said as he pulled something from within the cranium. The man stepped into sight. His rolled-up sleeves revealed the thick arms of a laborer with an arrow-shaped tattoo. Arrows were of course not an uncommon motive, but this one was so straightforward it seemed to belong on a street sign. So, this is it, he asked. Did the guy really hear the frequency through this device? Boerhaave opened a container. We'll learn more about it back at the lab. Let's get this ready for transport. Alboro stuffed away his notebook and turned away. Silently, they moved out of the office and back into the locker room, and carefully made their way to the exit, when suddenly, the wavecaster in the cafeteria appeared to change channels. As the frequencies changed, between the inaudible chatter of skipped broadcasts and the white noise, the device started to play ominous sounding music. The melody was arranged with artificially sounding tunes that the peelers could not associate with any known instrument. Even though the strains themselves seemed cheerful, the individual tones droned deep and dark, accompanied by a background chorus of white noise. I know that too, Bixby whispered, but I can't place it. He barely finished his thought when an eerie woman's voice started to speak. 8, 54, 68, 122, 321. Alboro froze as he heard the number 54 and turned to the wavecaster. The tattooed man from earlier walked up on the wavecaster. He was dressed like a typical working class chap, with brown pants hanging from suspenders. What the hell is this about? The officers quickly took cover behind the locker doors and peered through the three venting slits. Alboro opened his notebook again and listened closely as he noted down the seemingly random numbers being repeated on the wavecaster. Another, more stylishly dressed man joined his friend in front of the device. He seemed to be a well-off man dressed in black pantaloons. You know what this is? asked the other, clearly concerned. Could it be? the second man whispered in reference. Could be what? the other snarled. But then his expression changed and he responded in disbelief. No. The gentleman hoovered his hand over the wavecaster with venerative gestures. Alboro squinted his eyes. He could not see clearly, but it seemed the man was missing two fingers on his right hand. In the meantime, 
they went on. Maybe it's responding to the receiver we just pulled out of his head, said the gentleman. His friend seemed amazed by the suggestion. But wasn't that bloke a terrorist? Why, what? He turned around. Sister, did you hear that? Miss? There was no response. The man looked around, confused. Where did he go? Meanwhile, Alboro stepped back. Maybe it was the dark droning of the numbers being recited, but a sense of dread fell over him. Something's up, he whispered. No kidding, Bixby whispered anxiously. Without further comment, they slipped out of the room into the yard itself and scanned their environment. The descending sun had tinted the environment orange, and long black shadows shrouded the depot's interior. Alboro froze when he heard unfamiliar sounds reverberate among the rafters above. As he looked up, one of the heavy chains swayed from side to side, while the other ones remained motionless, as if frozen in place. There was no way that could have been the wind. Let's get out of here, Alboro whispered to Bixby. They barely stepped outside when a scream cut through the silence. They turned around and looked around the corner of the door opening. There, on the cafeteria floor, they saw the legs of the men in black pantaloons lay motionless on the floor. Bixby's voice quivered. What the hell? Alboro grabbed him by the shoulder. Let's get on with it. Scared out of their wits, they hurried across the depot ground, jumping over the tracks as they did. While on the run, they heard the rumbling noise of horse and wagon approach at an alarming speed. To their astonishment, the coach from earlier sheared past at a reckless velocity, leaving the scent of fresh paint in their wake. And yet, the driver cracked the whip to make the horses go even faster. Alboro's heart skipped a beat when the rampaging cartwheels collided with the sides of the rail tracks, bending the steel axle. What on earth is happening? Bixby lisped. Alboro, not even bothering to respond, ran toward the red light of the setting sun just past the locomotive when suddenly a shadow moved just beneath the roof. Startled and out of breath, they looked up at the rafters. Did you see that? asked Alboro. Producing his sidearm, Bixby nodded as his gaze scanned the ceiling. The inspectors both faced the same direction when suddenly a banging of colliding metal pierced their ears. Cast iron links rattled overhead as a shadow descended down from a chain. With the grace of a trapeze artist, a tall female dropped down in front of them. Her knees folded up at the moment of landing, and the sides of her tailored coat elegantly draped themselves around her female form. Then she rose up effortlessly, as if the impact meant nothing to her slender frame. As Alboro was blinded by the light from the red sun behind her, it was hard to distinguish her face, apart from the outline of her thin features and silvery hair which hung down her shoulders. The inspector got distracted by the numbers tattooed in her neck. It wasn't a single series of numbers either, but many running down her chest and shoulders, some of which seemed crossed out. Who are you? was Alboro's involuntary response. There was a strange clicking noise when she tilted her head. Her squinted eyes had a blank expression not unlike the dolls at the store, but beside those eyes was a faint spark of curiosity. Bixby stepped forward. We have the police. You are interfering with an investigation. The corners of her mouth curled upward with joy as two flashes of steel appeared from atop her wrist with such speed Alboro could barely register what just happened. Don't move or I'll shoot, screamed Bixby, but she came at them regardless. Alboro stepped between them, but was ruthlessly pushed aside, toppling him. As he hit the ground, two deafening shots reverberated through the depot. Alboro shifted his eyes as his ears were ringing, but it was already too late. The woman leaned against Bixby, who had his back against a locomotive. She looked the man in the eyes whilst her blades pierced his chest, and blood ran down his waistcoat. In a flurry of panic, the inspector drew his weapon and pointed it at the assassin. But as he was about to pull the trigger, she stepped sideways with such speed her form became a blur. His trembling hand tried to follow her, but she already lunged at him. A cold, shearing pain went through his fingers. They were gone! Blood ran down his arm as he stared at his maimed hand with a mixture of disbelief and dread. How could this be happening? Struck with a sudden flash of reality as he lay there, Alboro looked up into the woman's reflective eyes. He couldn't help but stare into her eyes that gazed at him with delight in his suffering. Why? She moved her arm slightly, but it was enough to make Alboro recoil and raise his arm in an attempt to shield himself. 
Two air-bursting blasts launched rubble dust between the two of them, knocking the assassin on her side. The man stepped into the red sunlight, wearing a peculiar beak-shaped mask over his mouth and thick oval-shaped glasses that were so reflective it blinded the inspector. The masked man stepped forward, aiming his large revolver and hissed, Gotcha now, you skank, and fired another two shots. She leapt away, her arm hanging limply by her side as she gave him the slip and vanished inside a maze of rusting hardware. Then silence. All the inspector could hear was the heavy breathing of the masked man, possibly pondering if he should give chase. Don't do it, all Burrow wanted to say, but his life was flowing out of him. The man then turned toward him. He was dressed strangely, baggy trousers bound at the shins with spats, a tight-fitted leather jacket and that mask that seemed to belong to a character from a Penny Dreadful cover. Alboro tried to scramble up while he peered into the man's oval glasses. Even in the twilight, he could make out his own reflection in the silvery shade. Who are you? What was she? Alboro mumbled. Associate 212. As the man kneeled down, his glasses reflected Alboro's paling face. Worry about yourself, he responded with a muffled voice. Bixby! Alboro looked sideways. Bixby sat with his back against the locomotive, a trail of his blood staining the boiler behind him. The old inspector lost all feeling in his arm as darkness encroached on him. Not like this, he stammered as the sun turned into a black disc. I have things to do. I need to live. What are you up to now? Asked a heavy, familiar voice. Why are you laying there? Why do you care? You have been skipping school again, haven't you? So what? 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 You have been listening to the first chapter of The Wrench in the Machine. An association of Ishtar story by Bonsert Bokel. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. The Wrench in the Machine and its prequel comic, S36, The Call Girl, is available on your usual online store such as Amazon. The association of Ishtar is a collection of science fiction, steampunk and Lovecraftian stories set in the multiverse of the association of Ishtar, which are freely available online for everyone to read. Thank you for listening.